Well, hello and welcome everybody to uh, this Meet the Experts event hosted by the Royal Meteorological Society. I'm uh, Professor Liz Bentley and I'm Chief Executive at the Royal Met Society, which is the learned and professional body for weather and climate in the UK. Um, we're an organisation that supports the individuals and organisations that work within meteorology. So we don't do any weather forecasting ourselves or any research into meteorology, but support those that do. And one of our um, key uh, uh, public outreach activities is the Weather Photographer of the Year competition. And we're ready now to launch that competition this year. And I'm delighted uh, to be at this launch event where you can meet some experts to, to discuss weather photography. Uh, we're proud to announce that this year Standard Chartered are our new sponsor for the competition and we're aligned with both our missions to raise the awareness about the impact of our changing climate and we're united in our commitment to improve the world's understanding of weather and climate impacts and also to inspire future action that can address the climate emergency. So if we can move on to the next slide, uh, the competition itself uh, launches today and um, will uh, stay open until June the 27th. Uh, we're on the same platform as we have been uh, for last year, which is the Zealous platform. And you can see the URL link to the competition at the bottom of this slide. Uh, so entries are open uh, and I would be encouraging you to look through the images that you have, uh, you've taken over the last few years uh, or go out and seek uh, that, that fascinating image that you can enter into the competition. We'll uh, close the competition on the 27th of June and then we have a judging process and I've been fortunate enough to be involved with all of the competitions. This is our eighth year that we've been running this competition. And I've been a judge in the last seven years as well, and will be a judge again this this summer when we when we close the competition uh, entries. And, and judging means that I can't enter the competition myself, which is a real shame. But it does mean that I get an opportunity to review the thousands of images that we get and the quality of images that we we see from all parts of the world and all different types of weather phenomena. So I'm really looking forward to judging again this year. When we finish the judging, we shortlist uh, about 24, 25 images, and then we open that up to a public vote. And so members of the public can go online uh, and vote for their winner of the Weather Photographer of the Year competition and see if it's the same as our judges uh, come up with or whether it's something new and different, which quite often it is actually each year. And then we'll announce all of the winners uh, and that will take place on uh, the 5th of October, so later in the year. And we'll have a number of um, uh, communication activities that keep you updated throughout the course of the competition. But yeah, if this is the launch event to get us started. And I'm delighted that we've got uh, three panellists that are joining us today. So if we move on to the next slide, you'll see that our panellists are Kirsty McCabe, who is a broadcast meteorologist and editor of Met Matters. I'll introduce Kirsty a bit more in a minute. Uh, we're also joined um, by Chris Ison, who is last year's winner, the 2022 winner of Weather Photographer of the Year. And I'm delighted that we've also got Jonathan Pollinger, who is a social media trainer as well. So I'll be chairing this evening's session. And what we'll do is we'll hear from each of our three speakers and there'll be an opportunity uh, to ask your questions during uh, the panel. Um, so please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen uh, and uh, enter your questions. And I'll get through as many questions as I can as we go into that panel discussion. So our first speaker tonight is Kirsty McCabe. As I say, she's a broadcast meteorologist. Uh, she's a Met Office qualified weather forecaster and also a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society. And over the years, Kirsty has presented the weather across a, a number of UK um, television channels, radio channels and digital networks. So you may have seen her on BBC, ITV, Channel 5, The Weather Channel, and more recently on Sky News. Um, she's currently the editor of Met Matters, um, which is the Royal Meteorological Society's platform uh, to provide engaging and accessible content on weather and climate. So I'm going to hand over to Kirsty if you can... Uh, share your screen and away you go. Thank you very much, Liz. I am just going to share my screen and hopefully that's working for you now. And I will just start the presentation. There, 
Right, hopefully you can all see that. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, I wanted to give a little bit more of a background, a bit, bit more about the meteorology to some of our more popular weather themes. So things like rainbows, fog and thunderstorms. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview about some of these topics. There's obviously a lot I could cover. So I've tried to pick out some of my favourites. Um, so how maybe rainbows form and where you might see them and things like that. And hopefully that's the sort of thing that might help you um, when you're trying to capture that perfect picture. So we'll start with something that makes me smile, and that is rainbows. And put simply, you need two things for rainbows. You need the sun to be behind you, low in the sky, and you need an array of water droplets in the sky as well. And they need to be in front of you. Now, it doesn't just, you don't just get rainbows forming when it rains. Sometimes you just, uh, you'll see them when you've got spray from a waterfall, a, a fountain, or even fog can do the trick. And the reason rainbows occur is because sunlight shining through the raindrops gets refracted and then reflected off the back of the raindrop and refracted again. And the refraction causes the visible sunlight to be split up into its component colours. And the colours have different wavelengths, which means they bend differently as they pass through the water droplet. And the end result is that we end up with this lovely arc in the sky with red on the top and blue on the bottom. Well, it's purple on the bottom and in order to see a rainbow you've got to have the sunlight hitting the water droplet at just the right angle so we'll normally see them when the sun's shining behind you low in the sky but especially the western sky in the morning and to the east in the evenings and the lower the sun is the more of an arc that you'll get to see and one of my favorite things about rainbows is that the angle at which the light is scattered is different for everyone so every rainbow is unique to the person looking at it and the best kind of weather to see the rainbows, of course, is that classic weather broadcast term of sunshine and showers. So if you hear that on the weather broadcast, that's a good time to go rainbow spotting. And I've got some more pictures of rainbows for you. Uh, this, of course, is a beautiful example of a double rainbow. Sometimes you can see more than one rainbow. You've got that second fainter rainbow just outside the main one. And that's formed by rays of light that have been reflected twice inside the raindrop probably because the water droplets are just a little bit of a funny shape. And the extra reflection means the colours in the secondary rainbow go in the opposite order. And something else that's got a little bit of a rainbow to it, you'll notice here, this is called a Brocken Spectre. Now, this is a large shadow that's cast by the person taking the photograph. So it's an observer high up on a, on a mountain, for example, and the shadow is being cast onto the cloud fog or the mist below them. And it's named after the Brocken, which is the highest peak of Germany's Hartz mountain range, and that's where it's often seen. And you, you, that happens if you're standing above the cloud or fog bank and the sun's behind you and your shadow is cast onto the distant fog. And around that, you might see that colored ring and that's referred to as a glory. And the shadow can fall onto water droplets of varying distances, which can distort it, make it look a bit funny. So sometimes it can look almost like the person is moving in the distance. And that could well explain when people talk about Bigfoot or Yetis, that may be what they've actually seen. Another optical phenomena, of course, is the beautiful ice halo. Now these need sub-zero conditions and quite often atmospheric inversions as well. That's a really good chance that you'll spot them. And this is an amazing picture actually by Kevin Forster, which shows 16 different kinds of halos around the sun. And these ice halos form when the ice is the, when the light's refracting through ice crystals. So you can often see those during winter. Obviously, it needs to be cold enough to get the ice. And the most common is that smaller circle. And um, that's a 22 degree halo. But you also have some other features you can spot um, either side of the sun, two very bright spots. They're known as sun dogs. And there's a little upside down rainbow up at the top. That's the circumzenithal arc. Ice halo is obviously very beautiful, but something that many of us have actually managed to spot this year are the northern lights. Now, that's an optical phenomenon way up in the upper atmosphere. And these stunning displays of the green, the yellow, the pink and all the different colours, that's actually caused by bursts of solar wind colliding with the Earth's magnetic field. It isn't always easy to spot. Obviously, you need to have clear skies and no cloud around for that. And you need to also have the right conditions in terms of what's happened with the sun. But if there is um, a more active period of the sun, you get this coronal mass ejection, then you might actually get a good chance of seeing the northern lights a little bit further south. Normally, it tends to happen places like Iceland, southern Greenland, Finland and so on. But 
we have seen it further south of UK and there are various websites and apps that you can use to see when you're likely to see it in your area. An interesting thing with Northern Lights, you might get a better picture through your camera than you will with the naked eye. So um, if you set a long exposure and have a tripod, but obviously my panellists will know a little bit more about the technical terms for getting a good picture, but you can spot some of these. Now, um, the other thing, of course, with the Northern Lights would be to look north. The next thing I'm going to move on to from the night skies, we're going to go to sunrise and sunset because there's something known as the golden hour. And that's the hour after sunrise and the hour before sunset. And that's when the light is just that beautiful, warm, golden rays, which really helps make some magical pictures. And this is a good time, I think, to tell you about um, why the sky is blue. You know, why is it red at the sunset? Why is it blue during the day? Well, it's all to do with something called Rayleigh scattering. And that's because as the sun's rays come into our atmosphere, um, it bumps into the tiny molecules of nitrogen, oxygen, and they scatter or deflect the light. And the amount of scattering depends on the wavelength. It's again similar to our rainbows. The shorter wavelengths are scattered more strongly. So more of that blue light is scattered towards your eyes than other colours. And since you see that blue light everywhere you're looking overhead, the sky looks blue. Uh, the reason it's not purple is just a trick of our eyes. Our eyes are more uh, sensitive to the blue colour. Um, of course, as the sun sets in the sky, then we get those beautiful pinks and reds and oranges. And that's again due to the Rayleigh scattering. This time, because the sun's very low in the sky, the sunlight's travelled through a much thicker amount of atmosphere. And that means that more of the blue portion gets scattered away and leaves more of the yellow, orange and red for us to see. Overall, though, it does make for some beautiful pictures. The sun's rays here just warming up the tops of the mountains. And you may have heard the expression red sky at night, shepherd's delight, red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. And unlike a lot of other weather lore, this one often holds true because in the UK, our weather systems typically move in from the west to the east and to do with the angle of approaching weather fronts and so on. So if you're looking at sunset, we could have high pressure moving in from the west and the next day is going to be dry and pleasant. So the red sky at night, shepherd's delight. At sunrise though, it probably means the high has moved away, the good weather's gone and more than likely not a wet and windy low pressure is heading in our way. So it's quite interesting one to actually hold true quite often. So that's Another lovely picture here of the sunset just lighting up the temple. And we've had some stunning pictures over the years of sunrise and sunset with that golden hour. Uh, one in particular that I really like is this mock mirage sunset over the Thames estuary. And that is where the sun's been distorted and almost appears to be sliced horizontally. And that can occur when we've got um, some temperature inversions in the atmosphere. So the sunlight's being refracted a little bit more as it travels through colder layers compared to warmer ones and that distorts how it appears. And you might also spot something there called an inferior mirage. So the distant buildings in South End appear to be elevated above their normal position. And that's again, an optical phenomenon. And in case you're wondering when we get the best sunsets, well, that actually tends to happen in winter because the air tends to be a little bit cleaner and crisper, with lower humidity. There's a lack of air pollution quite often in our winter wind directions and better clouds around. And as the sun is setting or rising, the change in the angle of the sun's rays can really highlight the clouds in the sky. So you can see that with this spectacular mamat mamatis clouds. Now, these are often associated with large cumulonimbus clouds and much more visible when the sun is low in the sky. And the bulges here at the base of the cloud are formed by turbulence within it. And I've got another example here, which is just beautiful mamatis cloud, quite stunning indeed. Which leads me into the next topic we're going to take a look at, which is clouds, mist and fog. Now, everybody loves cloud spotting, but there are some clouds in particular that really do lend themselves to great photographs. And my favourite one is the lenticular cloud. So these are often, well, not often, sometimes mistaken for UFOs, thanks to the lens or saucer shape, sometimes like stacks of pancakes. And they form when we've got stable air that's forced to rise up over a hill or a mountain. And that creates standing waves in the air downstream. And if the air is sufficiently moist, we'll get a lenticular cloud forming in the crest of each wave. And with many clouds, they tend to move with the wind. But in this example, the clouds almost seem to hover stationary because they're just staying in the crest of the standing wave. And that's when they can look a little bit spooky. Definitely one to look out for on windy days. 
Of course, the range of ways that clouds can be formed is quite vast. We've got surface heating, air mash classes, or being pushed up the side of mountains. And our atmosphere is so variable that we can really get such an enormous variety of shapes, sizes, and textures of clouds. And if you've ever spent time cloud gazing, you'll know they continually change. Sometimes you can see objects in clouds. If you look at this one, you might just be able to spot an elephant or maybe a woolly mammoth in the storm cloud. And the phenomenon of seeing things in, it, in objects is called pareidolia. Of course, you can get clouds on the ground, otherwise known as fog. And if you have ever wondered what's the difference between haze, mist and fog, well, it's all to do with visibility and relative humidity. So the relative humidity is a measure of the amount of moisture in the air compared to the amount that it could hold. Um, if the visibility is less than a thousand meters and the relative humidity is above 95%, then it's fog. If the relative humidity is still exceeding that 95%, but the visibility is more than a thousand meters, then it's mist. And then if it's if it's more than a thousand meters, but the humidity is less than 95%, in which case it's drier, then we're looking at haze. But what actually is fog? Well, it's basically tiny water droplets suspended in the air, just like a cloud, much lower down. And the droplets are between 0.1 millimetres and 0.1 millimetres in diameter. So any light reflected off it bounces off in different directions and you get this whitish veil. And there are some optimum conditions for fog to form. Uh, clear sky overnight or just some thin high cloud. And that allows all the heat to escape from the ground into space. We need some moisture on the ground. So near rivers is quite a good location and quite a lot of moist air at sort of the lowest 100 meters or so. Light surface winds, so just a little bit of turbulence is useful to get the fog going but not too much or it will disperse it and then quite often favorable local topography so maybe the cold air draining into valleys might concentrate that surface cooling. And if you've ever woken up on a foggy morning and wondered when that fog is going to clear or if you're planning to take your photograph of some fog but you'd like to have it just thin enough so you can maybe see through it just a little, then there's a useful rule of thumb, which I have to credit to Frank Barrow. So we're calling it the Barrow Fog Clearance Technique. And that is taking into account when the sun rises. So uh, take the month of the year you're in, for example, September, then that would be the ninth month. So the fog should clear by 9 a.m. For October, 10 a.m., November, 11 a.m. For midday, around about, and uh, December will be midday if it clears at all. And then for the new year, it's 13 minus the month. So we're looking at it should clear by midday in January, 11th of February, 10 for March and so on. And that sounds silly, but it does hold true because once the sun rises and gets to work on the fog, it will lift up maybe into low cloud or it will eventually clear. So a useful rule of thumb to know the month of the year, you'll know roughly when you can expect the fog to go. Fog also produces some lovely optical phenomena. We've got an example here of something called a fog bow. And to see that, you need, again, it's a cousin of the rainbow. So you need the sun to be behind you at a low angle in the sky and you need the mist or the fog to be there in front of you. And that's the tiny water droplets again, the lights reflecting off them and refracting through them. Uh, they're almost colorless though. And that's because the water droplets are so tiny. And finally, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about thunderstorms and lightning. Now, I've got a few dramatic storm pictures coming up for you. Um, obviously, if you are planning to do any storm chasing, then safety first. We um, want to make sure that you're safe. So do take into account if you are planning to try and capture rough seas or strong winds that you do need to be a little bit careful. Of course, you do get um, people who are very keen on chasing storms and uh, there's places in the world where we can see more storms than others. Um, I'll just go back to that one. That's showing you a tornado, of course, and that's the ultimate goal of many storm chasers. Most of them um, happen in the Great Plains, the United States. Uh, tornadoes only last a very short amount of time normally, so typically measured in minutes and they're relatively small, but of course, very destructive. Uh, the chasing season is quite well defined in the United States, um, usually focused around May. And that's when we've got the jet stream with a lot of disturbances in it. And that interacts with the warm, moist air pushing north from the Gulf of Mexico. And then you've got quite unstable, colder air coming from the mountains to the west. And that means we've got this very unstable air and this cocktail of air masses that results in these really violent thunderstorms. Um, 
This is a picture of a supercell, which is a powerful thunderstorm with a deep rotating updraft that can produce tornadoes, large hail, damaging wind gusts, uh, torrential rain as well. And they're really visually quite striking, looking almost, it looks almost like CGI. It's just absolutely stunning imagery. Um, and it's that smooth appearance of those lower clouds there shows where the air that isn't buoyant is being sucked into the storm by this powerful rotating updraft and you've got the colder air rushing out of the storm as well it really is quite stunning to watch um another thing obviously occurs with thunderstorms you can see there we've got lightning and in convenient place we also have a water spout now you might be wondering the difference between funnel clouds tornadoes and water spouts well, it all starts off as a funnel cloud descending down from the storm base. If it touches down over land, it's a tornado. And in this case, when it's touching down over the ocean, over water, then it's called a water spout. And it's an absolutely amazing picture to have both going on in there. Uh, around the world, of course, we have over 3 million flashes of lightning a day. That's about 44 strikes a second. And the flash of lightning is a large electrical spark while the rumble of thunder is caused by that noise of the intense heating and the expansion of the air along the path of the lightning. And lightning essentially is a giant spark that occurs within a cloud or between clouds, uh, between the cloud and the ground. There's three sort of main types. And it's all because an electric charge builds up within the cloud thanks to the millions of collisions between ice particles and water droplets within the cloud. If you've ever noticed there's sometimes a bit of a delay between the flash and the bang, we can use that to work out how far away the storm is. So you count the number of seconds between the flash of light and then the rumble of thunder and divide that by five, and that'll tell you the distance in miles. If you want it in kilometers, divide it by three. Um, and if you can hear thunder, then you are close enough to get hit by lightning, even if you can't quite see it. If you've ever heard of a bolt out of the blue, the can exist. So again, something to bear in mind to be careful taking the photographs. And of course, location, 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 very important um, if you're taking your weather pictures, but just about anywhere can be a good place to find a good weather photo because we get weather everywhere. Um, so you might just have to be more creative if you don't want to live near somewhere with some stunning scenery. Uh, but the, we've had such a range of pictures over the years from close ups of raindrops to wider views. Just about anything can look absolutely amazing. Um, we've got such a wonderful opportunity to take such brilliant photos and perhaps even photographs might focus on the effects of climate change and drought, for example, and have even touched on ice or snow. So there's lots of things that will make absolutely amazing photographs. Thank you very much. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. I mean, that was amazing. It was a great lesson for us all, I think, just to take a look at different meteorological phenomena, but to do it with the, <clears throat> the images from the competition, previous competitions, just fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Kirsty. And obviously, you'll be joining us for, for the panel. If you have any questions for Kirsty, either uh, linked with her presentation or generally around meteorology, I know there's one or two questions appearing in the Q&A, but we'll raise those as we get into the panel. But I'm going to move on to our second speaker. And I'm delighted that we've got last year's winner of the Weather Photographer of the Year competition, Chris Eisen. And Chris is a, an experienced commercial photographer. He's based in Midhurst, which is in West Sussex in the South Downs National Park here in the UK. He spent 14 years of his career at the Press Association covering a number of news and sports events. And since he left the PA uh, in 2014, he's worked in a variety of, of other, with, sorry, with a variety of other commercial clients. But he spends his personal time exploring the landscape and looking for that perfect location and I guess the weather alongside to, to produce these wonderful photographs. And that led him, I guess, to becoming our winner uh, of the Weather Photographer of the Year competition last year, something he says he's very proud of. It was this spectacular wave which we had on the first slide um, that we, we showed at the, the launch of this meeting, taken during Storm Eunice in 2022. And I, I assume you've got that picture somewhere in your presentation, Chris, so. Uh, yeah, I think I remember to put it in, yeah. Brilliant, so I'm gonna hand over to you. Great, thank you. It's a very comprehensive uh, history of my life, thanks. Uh, right, let's hit the right buttons. Great, it works, what do you know? Um, oops, oh, it's already going wrong, that's not good. <clears throat> right, okay, back to the beginning. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely brilliant presentation, Kirsty. I've scribbled a whole load of notes, uh, which I'll be using in the future, thank you. Um, 
so yeah i'm a professional photographer it's the only thing i've ever done um i won't say how long but it's a long time and uh yeah i was very lucky to uh honored to win the award last year this isn't the picture this is another picture but i, I put it in because it's it's a bit more real in terms of the distance that i was at when i shot the winning image um people think i was very close but i wasn't that close at all it's a trick of uh, long lenses uh and it also gave me an opportunity to use my badge for probably the last time but uh, get it out whenever i can um so that's my winning image uh and that's my camera after i took the women winning image um <clears throat> part of what i'm going to talk about is is planning uh and i planned <laughs> to get that picture but i didn't plan to end up covered in mud afterwards um so lots of people asked me if i was soaking wet and drenched and, uh, all sorts of funny questions it was dry when i took that picture and i had the wind at my back so i had um all the conditions i'd planned for it i knew exactly where i was going i'd been to new haven dozens of times before and uh what i didn't plan for was leaving heading to the car i was wearing um a pair of walking boots that let's say um were a bit older than they should have been and the uh, grip wasn't optimum uh, i went down a damp slope and before i knew it i was um, running in reverse a bit like uh wily coyote and then flat on my back so uh that uh yeah i'd fit i'd taken my last picture and i was on my way home so you've always got to be on your guard <laughs> in these situations um right this is sort of a brief chapter this is um categories of the things I'm going to talk about. Vision, very um, highfalutin way of talking about planning and um, uh, what it is you'd like to do. A little bit about of equipment, but not too much. And then weather and locations. So think about, I'd suggest you think about what it is you'd like to shoot. Uh, some people don't have an idea. Some people are very specific and they only want to do sunrises or sunsets or or, or whatever. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I've got a flighty brain, and I tend to be interested in lots of things, uh, which is both a, a curse and a and a joy. Um, <clears throat> I live near the sea, so I shoot a lot of seascapes. But uh, I'm also in the Southlands National Park, so I get to go up hills and see strange weather phenomena around here, which is uh, which is always interesting. Um, so it, all I'm suggesting is it's good to have a little bit of a plan before you go out and take pictures, check the weather. That's always a good idea and see if you can work with that weather. See if whatever your vision is, is achievable. And if it's not, think about a different habit, come up with a different idea. Um, and I'm just using this picture. You, people may recognize it. It's a place called Sycamore Gap on Hadrian's Wall which uh, must have been photographed 10 billion times. Uh, it's very famous. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be up there last year uh, for a commercial shoot, literally a mile down the road with English Heritage. And I was staying overnight, so I thought, well, I've got to go. <laughs> it's right there, I've got to go and do it. Um, but I can't take the same picture that everyone else has taken. Um, so I spent a very pleasant couple of hours sitting, watching, waiting, and uh, that was the result. Um, I, it may not be the best picture of Sycamore Gap. It may not be, uh, you know, uh, you know, how you, everyone has their own view. It's so subjective, but it's. I think it's different to what uh, most people would shoot. So, um, so I'm quite pleased with it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and just avoid the temptation to sort of replicate. You know, um, be inspired by others, but don't copy them some people will come back say sycamore gap and take a picture that's identical or near identical to something they've seen they've been inspired by but and that's quite satisfying but i would suggest that maybe it's more satisfying to have your own picture that's something that's different that's got your your voice in it uh and hopefully some emotion which is something that's often lacking in 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 modern photography um and uh, it's also important, sorry, that's, I'll jump back, just one other thing. It's important to know that 
you may not get a great picture every time you go out, but that's okay. Um, enjoy the process, uh, get out there, take pictures and, uh, and see what comes along. A professional photographers don't expect to take a winning shot every time they, they leave the house. So, so don't, don't stress. Um, something else I wanted to touch on was uh, post-production very briefly. Um, this is a picture in, of uh, that famous bridge in Portugal, in Porto. And the one on the left is the untouched, unedited picture shot in the fog early morning. Um, and then the one on the right is the one that I've, uh, after, after I've uh, edited it. And you can see I haven't done much. I've made it slightly cooler to reflect the mood and uh, taken out some of the yellow saturation to push that even a bit more. But um, some photographers you'll see will um, go sort of, in my opinion, slightly over the line and uh, start changing skies and adding things and taking things away. And um, I'm a bit old school, so uh, I try and avoid that as I would suggest that's a better way. Get it right in camera is what we say in the business. And uh, Slightly to illustrate that, I thought I'd stick a couple of iPhone pictures. So uh, next to uh, the, the picture that was shot in camera. Uh, this is on Lundy a few years ago, just before COVID. And uh, I do a lot of time exposures where you, uh, that's three or four minute exposure, maybe even five. You can see how the sky and the sea is all blurred. Uh, and on the left, you can see far more realistic view um, and I've realized that, uh, lots, I have lots of pictures in this scenario of the back of my camera because you stand in there for five minutes and you're sort of twiddling your thumbs and uh, you end, <laughs> sooner or later you get the phone out and start doing a few snaps while you're snapping. Uh, again, on Lundy, uh, just around the corner from the other one, um, a little pier there again, long exposure. And talking about kit here because you can see that the camera's just rested on a wall, on a stone wall, uh, but it's still a time exposure. That's because the tri I had a tripod, but it, I couldn't get it in the right position that I was being a bit picky about. Uh, so I uh, uh, wedged it, let's say, with bits of flint and uh, slate rather, and uh, managed to keep it steady while it, the camera sat there for a couple of minutes taking the long exposure. And again, Isle of Wight, long exposure, um, uh, more of the same really uh, and a much cooler edit again and finally Wittering Beach uh, many of you may know that uh, down here near Chichester um, I'll talk a bit more about beaches in a second um, and this is just to say uh, I live in Midhurst. Top left picture is, is the ruins at Midhurst. You may know it. And I, I followed a man uh, today while I was walking my dog. He had a camera and he sort of stopped every 10 metres, lifted his camera up, took a picture, walked on, took another one. And he, that's all he did. Um, and I was quite struck by that. I didn't talk to him, but get down, get up, look, look different directions, look through things, look behind you. Um, uh, these are all the voices that are screaming in my head when I'm out taking pictures. This is a sort of self-therapy. Uh, but, um, yeah, you know, the, the snow, the tire tracks in the snow is pure serendipity. And uh, the, um, the the big eye, London eye there is... You don't need sunsets. You don't need sunrise. You don't need golden hour. You don't need blue hour. You can, you can find pictures anywhere, anytime, like, as Kirsty said, weather's everywhere. So uh, yeah, keep shooting. Let's move on. Um, I had a, when I was at school, I had a, a row with my physics teacher about light. And uh, I was probably being a bit precocious perhaps, but he quite rightly corrected me and, and said, you cannot see light. You can only see the effect of light on another body or subject uh, and that's kind of what I've spent my life trying to tune into 
uh, seeing where the light is and also the color of light, because as Kirsty also said, it, it changes throughout the day. And uh, this is the South Downs. This is a place that I go to quite regularly. It's not far from me. Uh, and I, I go back over and over and over again to the same place to get familiar with it and just to see it in different light. Uh, and it's never the same. And that's partly because it's a hill and uh, the weather on the Chichester side of the Downs is going to be different to the Midhurst side of the Downs because sometimes it just stops when it gets gets to the South Downs. Um, I'm just going to check my notes because I think I've gone a little bit off the piece. Um, and I've put this in. So this is Eunice. This is the day that I took uh, the winning picture. And I just put that in there. That's my Lightroom gallery just to sort of show a few that keep shooting is what I'm saying if you've got a uh, this modern we're all shooting digital now I'm sure there's probably someone out there shooting film still but once you've got the camera and you've got a card in it you can just keep shooting so so do it um, uh, and just keep looking and keep shooting um, the uh, there's that famous um, theory isn't there by Gladwell about 10,000 hours or 10 years and you'll become an expert well uh, if you get out then you keep shooting then the more you shoot the sooner you'll be that expert uh, and most importantly just maintain your enthusiasm really it's just enjoy it enjoy the process uh, this is a my ironic slide um, it's not about the gear he says um, it can be and it can't and it doesn't have to be uh, that's me at the Olympics in 2012. Uh, often the most important piece of kit, uh, I was going to say, isn't the camera. Obviously, you need the camera, uh, but that could be your phone. You know, everyone's got a, a, a camera in their pocket pretty much these days. Um, but the when you're planning, lots of other things are useful. So bottom right, head torch. I was on a beach on Iona uh, waiting waiting for a, a dis firework display actually straight ironically and i knew that by the time i'd finished shooting i'm going to have to get off that beach in the dark uh so that to you know that to i couldn't have done that job without that torch um big umbrella and uh and a big um lens cap in the rain at stonehenge a towel um things like that they're so so helpful and Something a lot of people don't think of when you're shooting landscapes is a small tarpaulin. Only has to be not even a meter by a meter. You can put your gear or your bag on that on damp ground. That's actually a godsend, uh, and it doesn't it doesn't take any space up in your in your um, in your bag, which I think is is a real bonus. Uh, over here on the left uh, is an app that I use called the Photographer's Ephemeris, and it is amazing you can drop a pin anywhere in the world on any day of the year at any time past or present future and it will tell you uh, where the sun rises where the sun sets so this is today at stonehenge i didn't actually do this today i did this about a week ago uh, but i preset it for tuesday 25th of april uh, that's you can see 14 13 is the time 2 13 in the afternoon and the bright yellow line on the about two o'clock, that's the sunrise. The darker orange line at about 10 o'clock, that's the sunset. And the thinner one going to about seven o'clock, that's where the sun, the direction of the sun at 2.13. Uh, the blue lines are the moonrise and the moon set and where the moon is. And uh, it gives you elevation. It's just the most incredible app. Uh, and literally it uses Google. So anywhere in the world you can, you can use that. Uh, one thing that uh, I shot these during COVID, um, walking the dog, I, I think uh, quite a useful bit of kit for me in photography is my dog, uh, because he gets me out. And uh, I highly recommend getting a dog. Um, uh, and I shot this with one camera, one lens, and I just kept going back to the same place. And it's surprisingly liberating how uh, just having one camera and one lens really focuses the mind. And uh, again, talking to myself, my own head, 
uh, I do like to load up a bag of kit and uh, walk around a bit like a Christmas tree with covered in baubles, but it's really, really good to slim it right down to the bare minimum. And uh, then you, you just accept that you might have to miss some pictures that you can't get because you haven't got the right lens, but you'll get others because you are uh, far more focused in what you're doing and not distracted by uh, switching lenses all the time. Uh, it, Kirsty also touched on, uh, you know, the whole golden hour and sunset and sunrise and blue hour. Well, you can you could make weather pictures literally any time of the day or night. Um, yeah, I'll show you a night one in a second. Um, yeah, don't get too hung up about those uh, what, those times that are considered to be, uh, you know, the perfect times to photograph. Because if you sit and look. Uh, you'll always find something. And there's two schools of thought actually with photographers. With landscape photographers, often they, they think he, well, they think they, it's not wrong. Uh, they say, sit, absorb the space, uh, sort of get into the, you know, sit and breathe, have a, have a moment of mindfulness. And there's a lot of truth to that. And then you, you'll see your space very differently. Um, there's also another theory that uh, if you've stayed in the same place for 10 minutes, then you should move on. Um, so you can take your choice, really, uh, but uh, you can do both. Uh, sometimes if you're sat for 10 minutes and you're not feeling the, feeling the vibe, then, then move on. Other times you can just sit and enjoy and just, just be there. And uh, like I said, I keep repeating this, but being enjoying the process is, is kind of what it's about. And you'll get, you'll take better pictures because of it. Um, ah, yes. <laughs> um, so this is my favorite uh, weather forecast, pretty much. Um, this was last week, I think last Thursday. Um, this is where the magic happens for me. Uh, you don't know what you're gonna get. The weather forecaster basically, forgive me, <laughs> for everyone watching the weather forecaster doesn't know what's going to happen when tomorrow uh, on this day so uh let's go out there and let's be surprised and uh and and see what happens uh that's when you get pictures like this um it's a petworth park quite nearby heavy rain heavy heavy rain shower got drenched and then uh all of a sudden there was a break in the clouds the sun came out uh and there was just this beautiful uh, early autumn scene across the lake. It's just, just, uh, yeah, fabulous. And you can't plan for that. That's, that's the great thing about that. The great thing about landscape photography, sometimes you just uh, have to go with it and uh, enjoy what you find. And if you have that weather where it's unpredictable, yeah. The best weather pictures are on the edge of weather is what we say. So between storms and, uh, and breaks in the cloud. Uh, oh, sorry, I think I missed one. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is a night picture I talked about. Uh, it might be a little dark to see, possibly not the best choice, but that is rain at two o'clock in the morning. Um, and rain is really useful filter. You can see the sort of it, what looks like mist. Uh, it's not mist. It's, it's actually the rain obscuring the background. And uh, yes, yeah, just one of my favorite pictures. Uh, and a, to repeat a point I made earlier, uh, go back to the same place over and over and over again. You can have obviously as many places as you like, but just just keep going back and you'll you'll find something every time. So obviously those two trees are the same tree. Uh, the path in all of them is the same path seen from, well, the two on the right seem from almost exactly the same position. Uh, the the three further on the left on the bottom from a from a different angle and uh, different times of the year, different times of the day, uh, different seasons, and uh, you'll always you'll always find something new to look at. And uh, this one, I, uh, again, keep shooting. This is what it's come back to, keep shooting. This was shot on the same day as my winning image. Uh, I entered this picture into some competitions. It didn't win anything, which I'm um, mildly annoyed about. Uh, but hopefully you can see the face there. It's entirely untouched. Uh, that 
it's, it's barely even cropped that picture uh tiniest bit of a crop i call it neptune rising because it's uh, it's like a man coming in rising out of the sea very angry man um uh but you know you can't predict that you can't plan for that you can hope you can get something interesting but the more you get out there the more you shoot the more uh more chance you've got of getting something like that so get being surprised uh and that's that's about it for me um thanks for listening uh the two there's two instagram handles there top one's my landscapey stuff which is sort of uh self-indulgent and the Boston one's my sort of kind of work day to day commercial stuff. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to have to defend those weather forecasters out there with your, <laughs> I knew your you forecast would. slide. I'm glad um, it's on Zoom and we're not in the same room. Yeah, absolutely. But I, it's probably the app more than the forecasters. So yeah, yeah. depending on the people rather than the app. Great. Um, would you do me a favour, actually? You know the uh, the app you mentioned to do the sunrise, sunset with Google. Mm. Could you just put the link to the app in the chat so that people can... Oh, OK. Yep. Yeah. I'll wow. have a look. Yeah, I'll look at it. And if now. you if you've got any questions for Chris, uh, please put them in the Q and A, and we'll get through to through as many of those as we can during our panel discussion. Uh, but I'm now going to invite our third speaker, uh, and I'm delighted that Jonathan Pollinger is uh, able to join us this evening. Uh, he's been involved in social media for uh, well a number of years, probably going back nearly 15 years. He's been showing, working with companies, charities and organisations to get the most out of social networks, such as things like Facebook and LinkedIn, for example. Um, he's worked with uh, businesses, PR companies, charities, uh, governments, the, the list goes on and on. And he, he established a Boost Social Agency in 2022 which focuses on creating content and social advertising campaigns. And you get sought out many times, Jonathan, to come and talk about this. I think you've been delivering some training today as well. So uh, um, uh, very much a man in demand, and I'm delighted you're able to join us this evening. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Liz. And thank you, Kirsty and Chris, for your talks. Really uh, interesting and fantastic photographs. Uh, Chris, really, uh, really enjoyed seeing those. So. Uh, talk tonight just going to sort of put it into two parts really raising awareness and raising your profile as a photographer how you can do that digitally mainly social media but going to look at a few other digital methods as well and also creating a community as well I think that's really kind of uh, something that's in vogue at the moment and kind of like links in with raising your profile but it's a, it's a really strong way to develop uh, relationships online, uh, raise your own profile, raise the awareness of your of your work, and uh, engage with uh, with others on uh, online. So all, all really about awareness and uh, and communities tonight. So it's going to kick off with um, and it's mainly social media, but just kicking off with the non social media. So starting off with websites. So websites kind of some people think they're a little bit old hat and indeed my focus is on social media professionally but I still acknowledge the importance of a of a website the point of a website really is that it's the it's the hub if you like it's the central spoke of all your marketing activity and the reason for that is that these days people often use it as a sort of point of verification really or a point of authenticity so people might say discover you on Facebook or Instagram but if they're interested in learning more about your photography buying your photographers hiring you as a photographer then their next step or possibly their final step is almost certainly to use Google or a search engine and find your website. So you kind of like need that point of uh, point of reference there. It might not be the initial point of discovery, but it's good to have that solid presence on your on your website. If you are looking for people to discover you directly, which isn't impossible, of course, uh, they're going to once they've got your name, they're probably going to look that up on, a, as I say, a search engine. And therefore, it's important for you to show up and rank highly on the search engine results. So just a real quick uh, bit around uh, what's known as uh, SEO, which you may or may not be familiar with, search engine optimization. So it just means trying to appear as high as possible 
on the Google or Bing search results page so that people can go straight to your, your website. So that, hopefully that's going to happen when they put in your, your, your name. Uh, but you also want that to happen perhaps if you if they put in the word photographer or photography and your location. So just quickly, keywords are important on your website. So try and put phrases that people are going to search for on your website, but, but don't overdo it. Have a strong about page. So you are the photographer. So you want to go into some detail about your about your history. Tell a bit of a bit of bit of a story about yourself, perhaps how you got into photography, as well as the sort of standard stuff like contact information to, to make it easy for, for people to, to get in touch with you. Also, it kind of like works the uh, other way as well. So you want the website to point out to social media. So most websites these days have the social media icon sort of in the in the header or the footer. And that's that's almost like a, a, a must have. So people can click on those and visit them. Several times on many times on websites, it can be frustrating for for users if those links don't work. So do check that those icons actually uh, actually work. And perhaps to sort of go a bit further than that, and for best practice, put those icons and put a little bit of information about each of your social networks, and we'll talk about each of them briefly shortly. Put a little bit about that on your contact us page so the people have got a little bit more information there about why they might want to follow you on social media and let's not forget the social media it is it is about a conversation it is two-way all the networks have a two-way communications in system in, in systems in place that will makes it makes them different from say from say a website or the radio or uh, or TV, so therefore people can use things like Facebook Messenger. Uh, they can comment on your Facebook posts. They can send you an Instagram direct message, etc. So so there are methods to to for your potential customers to to contact you to get in touch. So therefore, I think it's it's important to have that social media stuff uh, on the uh, the contact us page on your on your website. Another thing you might want to do is think about uh, an email newsletter. So in terms of content for a newsletter, I think the word sort of news really says it all there. So if you've got regular updates that you want to send out, perhaps with a few sample photographs, tell people what you've been working on, that sort of thing, then that could well be content that they are interested in. And linking back to the website there, you can have a, a sign up form on your website so that people can uh, subscribe to your newsletter and uh, and get your your regular uh, regular updates there. Um, other things you might want to put in the newsletter, if you want to go further, then you could put uh, some tips and how to's and that kind of thing. If you want to get into the bit more into the passing on your your skills and your uh, and your knowledge. And that brings us on to the some people call it social media, but that brings us on to, to, to YouTube. So YouTube is really great for how to type videos. So again, on the sort of training aspect, how to use some of the equipment that Chris was talking about, how to set up your, your camera, all the sort of best practice photography kind of stuff. If you're happy to, to share that and develop a reputation around your skills and knowledge in that direction, then YouTube and the videos within that, a uh, very, very good way to, uh, to go there. So it brings on to on social media. So if we're looking at uh, the various social networks that you could you could employ, I think your first port of call uh, would be or should be um, Instagram. And uh, interestingly, Chris kind of like uh, illustrated that with his two um, uh, Instagram handles there at the end of his uh, end of his presentation. And uh, Instagram is is a great place because it's like fundamentally visual so it's ideally suited to photography ideally suited to, to videos as well video side has kind of like overtaken the photography side a little bit on uh, on instagram but uh, photographs still have a, a very uh, very important place there and the, the good news with instagram is that it's actually 
it's quite a sort of friendly, informal place. So uh, if we're talking about the community side of things, which we'll get more in, into shortly, but it's it's very easy to sort of communicate, develop a, a relationship with a with with a partner person that you might uh, work with, uh, organisation that you might work with, and um, and also potential customers as uh, as well. So I think probably Instagram first port of call and there's different channels on Instagram as well so you've got uh, stories which are great for informal type content perhaps how you're setting up a shoot so sort of behind the scenes type content that uh, that kind of thing uh, it doesn't have to be have to be that polished whereas if you're looking at the main feed also known as the the grid on Instagram then that is better if it is polished. So that's where you want to showcase some of your work uh, on uh, on Instagram there. Uh, and you've also got reels on Instagram, which is the, the video side of it. So that is quite important these days in terms of getting uh, visibility and therefore raising awareness. So if you can create a few short video clips, reels are basically Meta's um, rival uh, or, or clone, if you like, of, uh, of of TikTok. TikTok massively popular, and Reels getting uh, getting more popular as well. Uh, moving on to to Facebook, Reels and Stories are available on Facebook, but not quite as popular as uh, as on Instagram. And if you're curating content on Stories and Reels, I would just tend to post it, arrange it so it's posted automatically over to Facebook. Book as well probably come a time where you sort of need to have different reels and stories content on Facebook but right now you can just sort of pass your Instagram content uh, across but for your Facebook posts you want to do something different and I think again sort of showcasing your work is probably the best uh, best use of the uh, of the main Facebook um, Facebook feed uh, one important thing is that it's not just about the photos, so the, the text or copy uh, that goes with the photo that you've uploaded or video, that's like really important as, uh, as well. So um, on Instagram, it's called the, the, the caption, so make sure that you've got a thorough uh, caption organized in there, and on, uh, on Facebook, it's just called uh, uh, the uh, text or copy uh, or description that goes um, goes with your with your photo kind of like a way of differentiating the two actually is that Facebook you you start off writing with your with your copy and you may or may not add a, a visual element so a photo or a video whereas Instagram is the other way around so it kind of like illustrates the importance of the visuals on Instagram where you'll upload a photo or a video first and then you'll actually excuse me then you'll um, then you'll describe it uh with a uh, with a caption also worth a uh, mention at this point uh for uh primarily for discovery is uh is hashtags hashtags very important with social media uh I wouldn't bother if I wouldn't bother at all to keep things simple on Facebook. People just don't really use uh, hashtags on Facebook. But Instagram, in contrast, very, very important. You can put up to 30 hashtags on a on a caption. And I would probably aim for about 15 to, to, to 30 and have a good sort of selection of popular hashtags, niche ha hashtags, location hashtags. Uh, and uh, hashtags around uh, around your, yourself, even um, what your uh, sort of particular um, interest in uh, in photography uh, in photography is. So, uh, if it's uh, sunsets, for example, you can do a whole bunch of uh, or a few hashtags uh, around uh, around that. Uh, I'm just putting in a sort of um, curveball on looking at the actual networks I'd also consider LinkedIn so LinkedIn sort of known as a professional network some of you might think of it as a sort of jobs type vacancies type site and it used to be like that but it's very much uh, more about networking these days so 
again, if you're looking to partner with other organizations and people and photographers, and maybe a little bit on the on the sales side, then uh, I think LinkedIn could be interesting. And particularly suggesting that because it's it's kind of like moving more to become more more like um, I say totally like Facebook, but it's it, it's definitely becoming a more informal place. I kind of used to actually say in the workshops about uh, just literally probably three years ago uh, that you'd never find any holiday photos on um <clears throat> excuse me on um on linkedin but um now you do on a regular regular basis um all sorts of different types of uh photography and so not only is the the type of content changed from being a bit more formal and business like on linkedin but there's definitely more uh more photography so i think there's scope for uh, uh weather photography on um on linkedin as uh, as well uh just sort of looking at a few things quickly on the um community side so specifically i think if you're looking to create uh, a community on a particular network i think facebook would be the place to go there so you can set up what's known as a facebook group and that's really good if you're bringing together a, a group of people around a particular topic. And my advice there, obviously, if it's, it's going to be photography, but to be really niche around that. And so that could be weather. But I would even go beyond that and, and maybe specialize in a in a subset of weather. I think you're more successful in creating a, a community, the more uh, the more niche it uh, it is. Um, so. Facebook, I think the uh, the way to go, uh, the way to go there. Uh, one thing for both awareness and uh, and communities not to uh, not to ignore is collaboration. So do think about partnering with other photographers, um, other organisations, even if it's just a sort of a loose arrangement to share each share each other's content. But it could be more. Uh, more sort of cross promotion um, going on there. And one thing on the personal profile side, which be good for you to raise uh, and thereby raise the um, uh, awareness of your photographs as well, is if you get a chance to do anything like a, a guest blog or be a guest on a, say, a podcast, which are becoming um, more and more important these days, then uh, that's um, that could be a, a good opportunity to take up. But make sure you only sort of go for the higher quality and reputable blogs and podcasts. There's always people trying to get you on uh, that kind of kind of thing, but you may not want to be associated with them. But if it's a good quality blog, good quality podcast, then um, I would go with that. And just one final thing is on all those things that I've talked about so far, the sort of so-called organic side of uh, of social media so uh, as in uh, as in free but there is the the paid side of social media with regard to advertising so yes of course you need a, a budget for that but if you have if you have a budget even a fairly small budget that can be a really powerful way to fairly quickly grow your grow your audience and again I mentioned niche before if you have a particular specialism around your photography then that can be really good in terms of reaching the right people with your with your paid ads and you can do that on any of the social platforms including uh, Facebook Instagram and uh, LinkedIn that uh, that I mentioned so uh, I think that's pretty much it in terms of um, how to raise awareness and uh, and grow a community. So uh, back to Liz. Brilliant. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so three really interesting talks they're giving us a perspective, both of meteorology, photography and the social networking side uh, to interact with your audience. Uh, we're going to move into the panel now and um, if you've got any questions for either of the speakers please uh, add that to the q and a i'll just invite jonathan chris and kirsty back onto the stage if you can put your cameras on and unmute that would be fantastic and well there's one question that's coming actually from lucy and i guess it's for all of you so lucy asks, what subjects do each of the panel members most like to shoot and why and if it's not actually a a, 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 a i guess an image maybe that you want to capture if you haven't been able to to do that or you know an image that you've seen that you just think wow i wish i'd been able to capture that that you know that particular um 
uh, I don't know, whatever it is, whether phenomena or, or subject that you're looking at. So I'll start with Kirsty, please. Um, well, I'm picking up all the tips tonight because I'm not an expert with the camera, but I do take a lot of pictures of clouds. Um, I can share my screen. I sometimes pop into schools and do little talks about uh, weather. So if I share, find the right one, this one here, then you should be able to see hopefully lots of little pictures of clouds. <laughs> I don't want to start from the beginning. How do I start at the end? Don't know about the magic of that. If I can go right to the end, I don't want to see the whole thing again. I don't think I'm sharing anymore, am I? No. Nope. No, cool. Let me just jump to the end and try that again. The joy of tech. Da -da -da -da. So. Lucy, who asked the you question, has yeah. put in the Q&A that she's also a cloud spotter as well. So. Good. <laughs> yeah, so I've just taken lots of different pictures of cloud over the years and months. So anything from contrails to cirrus clouds with a nice bit of rainbow iridescence in them to when this looks like the sun's on fire, uh, sun's made the clouds look like they're on fire, nice puffy cumulus clouds or big cumulonimbus or a bit of lenticular, so if it looks like something like a fish or a bird, or even a nasty storm cloud. So these aren't particularly inspiring photos, but just, yeah, I will happily, if I see a nice cloud, I will stop in the street and take pictures to my children's shame. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks, Kirsten. Chris, what about you? Uh, well, I've got two answers uh, because one of them is the same. Sorry, I've lost you. How do I find you again? There you are. Um, yeah, definitely into clouds. Um, mine are a little bit uh, darker and sinister the way I shoot them. Um, if you go to my personal Instagram, you'll see what I mean. Um, uh, but the second one is seascapes, just uh, uh, just because it's literally never the same. You know, you know, it's like you go to the beach or wherever by the sea, and if you're anything like me, you can, I can just stare at the sea all day, even if it's flat calm. <laughs> it's just there's something hypnotic about the sea um, and uh, yeah, and, the, and if the weather picks up, then uh, yeah it can get really exciting um yeah so so those two things really brilliant jonathan do you have a favorite subject yeah i um i like to take pictures when i'm out on uh out running so um as you can see from the the one uh, one behind me and um yeah interesting that chris mentions the sea i find the same so if i'm running by the sea and i live in cardiff bay so passing the bristol channel on a regular basis and um yeah, if you have a look at my Instagram, um, then uh, you'll see some examples there. And when I post, I mean, I post a whole bunch of content to friends on Facebook, but those actually seem to be the most popular uh, popular pictures, the um, sort of uh, photos captured when, when out and about uh, running. So just general landscape shots, uh, I guess. Yeah. Um, I just add one other thing, not directly answering the question, but I can't resist passing on a social media tip just to say that uh, on social media, by far and away the most popular type of photo if you to sort of categorize them down people photos always work the best yeah it's great thank you um so we have one actually on clouds itself so this is probably for you kirsty so uh, ben asks what are noctilucent clouds and how predictable are they great um i actually got some noctilucent clouds already let's hope i can share this so hopefully you can see that yep brilliant yeah, so noctilucent clouds are extremely rare and um, they're very high wispy clouds. They're made out of ice crystals and they're seen in the night sky, usually on very clear summer nights. And they, they become visible about the same time as the brightest stars do. And they're usually sort of bluish or silvery in colour. And these actually occur really high up. They're the highest clouds in our atmosphere. They occur up in the mesosphere. Um, actually up quite just near the mesopause, so almost at the very top of the atmosphere. They're about 50 to 53 miles up in the sky, uh, normally near polar regions. And a recent study from NASA suggested that the clouds are actually seeded by space dusts. So in terms of predictability, um, not that easy to predict, but perhaps if there's any comets or meteorites or asteroids going on, then it could, the tiny particles of dust from these could act as condensation nuclei for the ice crystals to form. Um, I've got another picture of one of these there as well. So that's another picture 
of these noctilucent clouds. Um, and I know that there is another type of cloud that we often talk about whenever we talk about noctilucent clouds. People often ask about um, nacreous clouds as well. These are also extremely rare. They occur just a little bit lower down um, in the stratosphere, which is still really high up in the sky. And again, it's quite rare to see. Now, the noctilucent ones, the shimmering cobwebs, they tend to be seen in the summer. These ones, the nacreous ones, are a winter one. They're also known as mother of pearl clouds uh, or polar stratospheric clouds. And these you'll see in polar regions during the winter. They need temperatures um, below minus 78 Celsius to form, which you're only going to find up in the stratosphere during the polar winter. And they're best seen uh, just before sunrise or after sunset when the sun's just below the horizon. And you'll notice the colours are almost reminiscent of the colours that you see in a film of oil um, on top of water. So this is the iridescence and it's just because of the smaller particles, just the way that they scatter the light. But um, absolutely stunning. Um, sometimes get bit, people can confuse them with the northern lights, but they are actually something different. Uh, nacreous clouds. So there you go, not to listen in nacreous clouds. Brilliant, thank you. Nice to see some images as well, because it's hard to describe these, but I'd certainly seeing the images is, is really helpful. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, so uh, Jody has asked, and this probably for maybe for you, Chris, uh, most of the time when I take a photo, they don't do it justice. So I guess sometimes you see things with the eye, it looks better, but actually with a camera, you just lose it. Is it something she's doing wrong photography wise, or are there certain things where it is better just to see with the natural eye? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, my wife gives me a lot of grief uh, because I'll see something and I'll shoot it and she says, just enjoy it. You don't have to take a picture of it, just enjoy the moment. Uh, but I suspect it's partly emotional. Um, obviously, you see in 3D and your image is in 2D. Uh, it could partly just be the way your, is it a camera or a phone? Uh, a mother. I've lost the question. Say, no, it was there. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't say really. Doesn't say, but, um, yeah, a lot of it's about emotion and, and three dimensions and, and losing that. Yeah, uh, we've all done it and it happens to every professional. They've taken that picture and you think, hmm, it doesn't look as good as I remember it. Uh, we've all been there. Yes, yeah, you're not alone. Great. So uh, probably one for you, Jonathan. Um, we, we asked for a captions. You mentioned this when you were chatting in your presentation. So not just information about maybe where you took the image and, you know, the camera that you used or whether you were using a smartphone, but actually trying to tell a story of, you know, how you got to where you were and what you were looking at and maybe something that was going on around you. How important is it to kind of do that storytelling? Oh, I think it's absolutely uh, vital, really, really important. Kind of uh, harks back to what Chris was saying around uh, how I think you think your line was something like mo modern photos lack uh, lack emotion, and social media posts work the best if they can kind of uh, draw out emotion, if they can actually make somebody feel a little bit. And so that is the combination of the visual element and the and and the copy. And yes, storytelling is is one way of doing it. And also perhaps talking about how you're actually feeling when you're taking the photos. So maybe if you're involved in storm chasing or something like that, there's going to be an element of, of fear there, I would suggest. So if that's what you're feeling, if you can get that over to a, to a certain degree, or say a sunrise picture and sort of new beginnings and, and those kind of feelings, start of a new day, et cetera. Maybe not quite as cliched as that, but you know, anything kind of like personal to you uh, that you can get across in the words that, uh, that enhance your, uh, your image, very, very uh, important to, to do that, yeah. Great. Uh, so a question from Rachel, probably for you, Chris. So any recommendations for equipment, uh, camera equipment, for example, for a novice wanting to just go go out and just have a play, really, a little bit more advanced than just mobile phone photography? Yeah, so uh, first question I always ask, which I won't, maybe I won't get an answer for, is budget. Uh, how much do you want to invest? Uh, you pick a figure, really. But uh, if if you're just dipping your toe in the water, uh, I would suggest getting not an expensive camera, but something that maybe you can uh, change the lens on. So you've got a bit of variety um, and something that you can use with manual settings, because then you can really play. Um, if, you, if, if you've got a camera that's just program or auto, then it's thinking for you. you. You need to play and enjoy it and, and um, 
change settings and see what happens when you overexpose or underexpose or, or you know, blur and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but uh, you, you could do that for a, a few hundred pounds. And and uh, there's so many cameras out there, new and secondhand, you don't have to buy new. You, there's perfectly good retailers who will sell you a very good secondhand camera because someone's bought it and they've decided to upgrade to the next thing. It, photography is very addictive when it comes to kit. <laughs> we're, we're all and I guess get, cam get. cameras on mobile phones are very good though so you know they're they, excellent. they can make yeah. some really good quality I mean we all carry the phone around so again mm. if if you're out somewhere and you know that you see something and, you know and you haven't got time to kind of either go get the camera out of the car or whatever it is mm. the phone itself can produce some really good images and we do have that the you know the category for the mobile phone uh, images coming in and they are just as spectacular sometimes as done mm. with the you know professional camera yeah, photographers say the best camera is the one you've got with you. Yeah. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, if you've got a phone in your pocket with a camera, then that's the one. Mm. Really? And of course, there's obviously apps that you can put on your phone to then uh, in edit with. So yeah, yeah. I, I keep saying to people in 10 years, maybe less, uh, I won't be shooting on professional cameras. It will be on a phone or some sort of device. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Okay, so Jane has asked, and probably for all three of you, what's the absolute favourite photo that you've taken and are proud of and why? Well, we'll go to Chris. I mean, maybe I can guess which one this is. But <laughs> Well, it's between the two that uh, that were taken on the same day, probably, I'd say, that the the face, Neptune, or, or the one that won. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Long, once upon a time, I could remember every single picture I'd ever taken, but uh, that was a very long time ago now. That's gone. Uh, so yeah, definitely those two are, are, are right up there. Good. Jonathan? Uh, probably one that I took a long time ago, back in the um, 80s. It was very rare, lucky to be in uh, Red Square at the time in Moscow. So I took a picture of uh, some of the, well, some pictures of some of the sites around there. And uh, one or two of those came out uh, quite well. I think I bought one with a um soldier uh in it all uh, all dressed up in the russian uh, russian uniform uh in the uh, in the foreground and then i got um promptly uh almost not quite marched off think be exaggerating so i was marched off but i started walking somewhere where i was supposed to go and i was i was escorted or i should uh, i should away so quite good memories of, uh, of that one <laughs> again the story behind the photo yeah. is well, just as important isn't it so kirsty and you um, I think probably the first time that I saw a lenticular cloud in person, having learned about them at the Met Office College. So it's probably not the best photo, but I've got a picture of me kind of going, oh, and pointing at one in the sky and being very excited about it. So that's probably most of the memorable ones are things that are personal, I guess. Brilliant. So Andy mentioned, because obviously the, the, the winning photo that you took, Chris, was in Storm Eunice. Andy says that there haven't been any UK named storms this winter. So, you know, there have been some, you know, there's been some stormy weather, but none of the UK named storms have come from those. So I guess we're hopeful that we might actually start to see some really good storms during the summer, those kind of classic electrical kind of convective storms that we see, uh, you know, maybe rumbling up from France into the English Channel and, and uh, up, up across the UK. I guess it's not really a question, but any thoughts really on, you know, uh, maybe Kirsty, your thoughts on kind of what we might be, you know, in a treat for us uh, as we go into the summer months, the kind of weather phenomena that we can look at, particularly if we're thinking about taking, you know, photographs of them. Well, we mentioned the noctilucent clouds earlier. So possibly, if you're lucky, you might manage to spot them in the summer nights. Uh, I guess I'm more worried about it being another hot one and drought this summer. So um, I know that we're kind of focusing a little bit on climate change this year. So perhaps that's something that might make Maybe not the most cheerful picture, but yeah, we could be seeing some pictures that um, could represent that. In terms of storms, um, potentially we could see some quite extreme weather um, with the extra heat in the atmosphere. Uh, then, yeah, we could see some bigger, heavier downpours, large hail and gusty winds all likely to happen with the bigger storms. So, um, yeah, it's not what I'm after this summer, but that could well be happening. <laughs> and Chris, you, you obviously said you look at the forecast. Um, you know, when you're looking ahead, where, where you're going to take these images, 
if if there's a name storm in the forecast, if there are warnings in place, does that you know do you go to a particular place to to look for these big waves at the coast, or you do something very different when you know there's something in the forecast that will actually catch your eye? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you react to them differently because they they are all different, and I, I keep a I say it, database is a rather grandiose uh, turn of phrase, but I, I keep a list of places that I think, oh, maybe this would be good for snow, this would be good for rain, this would be good for spring, uh, and so on. Um, and with, say, with Eunice, uh, the the storm was, the, the, the weather forecast has actually nailed it. It was amazing, to the minute. It hit, it hit New Haven at exactly the same time it was meant to, as predicted, and the high tide hit at, at, at exactly the same time, so you sort of had the per perfect storm, really. Mm -hmm uh but yeah you, you always look at wind direction and uh and, and things like that and also sometimes with wind you can't see wind of course a bit like light but you can only see the effects of it so uh yeah you've got you've got to go somewhere where you can see trees waving in the wind or sand blowing across a beach or, or, or things like that things that are going to be visibly affected by the whatever the phenomena is and a lot of the images that we get have some sort of landmark you know, somewhere recognisable, you know, alongside the weather that kind of draws your eye, you kind of know instantly where you are just from, from you know, where, where the image was taken. But if, if, you, if you're out and about in a region that hasn't got kind of these landmarks, whether it's, you know, a lighthouse or, a, you know, a building of some sort, any, any suggestions of how you can kind of, I guess, spice up an image if you haven't got something else kind of going on? I don't know. Maybe one to Chris first. Maybe Kirsty, you might have some thoughts when we're thinking about just the the kind of meteorological side of things. Chris, any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it goes back to what I said about change, changing your angle and your point of view. See if you can get elevated. See if you can well see, get down on the floor. I spend half my life lying on my belly um, and uh, look through things. Lead the eye. Uh, off, you can frame uh, through trees and, and shapes. You can you know, sort of lead the eye to something that's there. Um, yeah, have fun with it and change. Just change your position. Yeah, the, the, obviously it can work. Just standing there, full height, snap. But chances are you're going to find a better shot if you if you get higher or lower or, or something. Yeah, and we've had we've had some images come in that are taken from drones. So you almost have to. It might be taken from above, looking down and. You know, as a judge, you're looking at it thinking, what am I looking at here? It takes you a moment to kind of get your perspective because it's not normally what you'd see kind of with, you know, just naturally through the eye. So, yeah, different ways of different ways of looking at something can certainly kind of just bring an intrigue to a, an image. So, Kirsty, yeah. any thoughts from a meteorological perspective? Um, I was just going to say a, a lot of what Chris says is absolutely brilliant. And also um, just wait a bit because... Um, the weather changes quite a lot in this country. We can mm. get all four seasons, if not more, it feels like in some days. So yeah, if you don't like what you're looking at, just wait. It'll, it'll pass and something new will come through. And yeah, like if you're doing the same walk every day, it might be different every day. But if you know in advance it's going to be a foggy night, then mm. you know, maybe just go out there and wait and wait. And especially the hours around sunset and sunrise, that's when things quite often get changeable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got all weathers. Get out there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Plenty of weather to photo, photo uh, to take photographs of. So, Jonathan, when we when we get down to the judging and we have a shortlist and open it up to the public vote, um, you know, usually somebody who's quite active on social media can attract people to to vote for their image. Is there is there anything they can do, you know, to encourage people to kind of get behind them? Is there kind of campaigns that they can do either on social media or elsewhere really to to just, you know, get get support behind their image? Yeah, I mean, the obvious is just to use the channels to get the word out there, definitely putting in a, a link to the to the competition. But I think it's kind of like trying to come up with a a reason for them to support you so again the sort of story aspect the personal angle to it perhaps give them a a reason why uh, why they should get get behind you um and consistency probably as well so consistency across the different channels and not too much but on a fairly fairly regular basis to uh, to get the word out there but i think the most important thing is just try to because everyone's going to be doing that so probably just 
put a, putting up a compelling sort of argument, personal reason why you're looking for, for, for that support is probably the best angle, I think. Great, and a last couple of questions that we've got in the Q&A, probably for you, Chris. So Joanne, uh, Joanna asks, uh, do you have any suggestions for what sort of long lens might be suitable for a novice uh, to, to try out? And uh, one from an anonymous attendee, do you use filters or polarizer? Uh, if so, could you recommend anything uh, for different scenarios? Yeah, uh, so Joanna first. Uh, uh, lots of photographers, well, people who have cameras, the first thing they do is they get a wide angle lens uh but uh, and that's there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but for me the real uh sort of the, the secret that people don't really realize amateurs don't realize is a long lens will give you something way more interesting um so i would definitely look at doing it well a good standard zoom is it's a 70 to 200 millimeter uh that's really good maybe, maybe you're 100 to a 300 something like that if you don't want to go for a zoom, uh, then it's, you know, it's hmm, 180. I don't know. That's, that's showing my age. You probably can't buy a 180 mil lens anymore, but yeah, something like that. 135. Yeah. And filters. Yes. Uh, I did mean to mention that actually, um, uh, without getting too techy, but, uh, this person probably knows that, uh, uh, neutral density filters are a secret to my success. Um, so what they do is they they block light equally and without affecting the color uh and you can get solid ones so you can the whole image is is uh has less light going on evenly or you can get graduated ones which you just have to sort of grade the sky uh, and you can make a, dark, a, a sky very moody quite easily with a, a neutral density graduated filter I do use a polarizer. He mentioned polarizers, yeah. but do you know what? I think you can overdo it with polarizers. I, I've, it's never been my first choice. You, you can go, for, you, you often end up with the oversaturated look, and that's 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 a that's a very Instagram look. But um, it's just, I find it a bit false. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I spend my life turning down color, not turning up color. Yeah. Great, fantastic advice. So I'm going to go around the three of you and just one tip, take home message for people who are thinking about entering the Weather Photographer of the Year competition. Uh, who wants to go first? Let's start with Jonathan. Yeah, so I think try and get that personal connection with people, engage your audience, use social media for the for the conversation, talk about the conversation. Com talk about the competition and one thing I haven't talked too much about is the private messaging side of, uh, of social networks so I mentioned the community aspect of Instagram so I think even doing something similar like you pick up a follower on your Instagram account why not message them and tell them about the competition start uh, start a conversation that way brilliant thank you Kirsty um I just can't wait to see the pictures. So if you see something that just makes you think, wow, we, you know, we live in such a fantastic place, you know, the world as a whole, but even just locally, I love seeing where people live and the weather that you have. So uh, yeah, just take pictures and just do it. And, you know, anyone can take part. You can have an amazing camera. You can have just a smartphone. You can do whatever you want to do, but I, I think it's going to be great. I think it's so lovely to see the pictures that come through that. I just take part. I want to see them. Great. And Chris, one tip: how how can someone become the next weather photographer of the year? Well, I'll get I'll get a nick a tip from uh, Billy Connolly um, <laughs> when he said, uh, "There's no such thing as bad weather; just the wrong clothes." <laughs> Whatever the weather, get out there, shoot, uh, and uh, yeah, obviously get wrapped up or, or whatever. But yeah, just get out, get out and shoot. Brilliant. So a big thank you to the three of you. Uh, excellent presentations. We've gone through a whole range of things and some really interesting questions uh, during the, the Q&A as well. So thank you very much. We've just got a few closing slides uh, just to remind you the standard chartered weather photographer of the year competition launches today uh, so you can now start submitting your entries onto the, the platform. You can see the URL link at the bottom of this slide. Uh, the competition stays open until the 27th of June, then we go into the judging um, uh, side of the competition and we'll be then opening up for public vote for shortlist as we go into August and September time and the announcement of the winner is in October.
So encourage you to enter the competition. Also encourage you to join the Royal Met Society. So next slide uh, gives you some details about membership of the Royal Met Society. There's lots of reasons to become part of uh, our society. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more, then again, there's a UL URL link at the bottom of this slide to find out more. Um, just get in touch with the society as well if you if you want to find out a little bit more about membership. Uh, and final slide again, just to, to encourage you to, you know, get out there, take those photographs, dig through some of your archives over the last few years, look for those spectacular images, get them into the competition and yeah, good luck. Hopefully we see you in the shortlist and potentially the next winner of the Standard Chartered Weather Photographer of the Year. Good luck, everybody.